Um, so today's presentation is Reverse Engineering Malware, uh, a look inside Operation TOFAR. Uh, so we've got quite a bit to get through for an hour, so uh, we'll jump right into it. And uh, this here is a, a chart from the 2014 Verizon DBIR, uh, the Data Reach Investigations Report. Um, and the chart here shows that malware has been largely on the rise over the past couple of years, and it's become a very big problem. And something interesting to keep in mind is that uh, the DBIR isn't representative of all incidents, but just some of the major incidents that get reported. Uh, so we actually estimate that, uh, I guess, malware would look a lot more significant um, if we were to broaden the scope. Um, so malware is a big problem. Uh, it's a problem that appears to only be getting bigger as you know, time goes on, like the chart here shows. Uh, and it's something that I'd wager most of us working in information security see. Uh, I saw it when I was on an incident response team. I see it at my work here at Landcope. We hear it from customers, and actually, as of the last few years, or now over the last week, we've, it's actually been something we've been uh, seeing on the news. Um, so malware can be full of interesting features, and we'll talk all about identifying them. Um, but there's a couple more stats that I wanted to pull up from the DBIR. Uh, these two are from 2013. They just didn't have uh, this type of stat uh, in this past year's edition. Um, so the first one says that 75% of malware contained functionality of spyware or keyloggers. Uh, and the second statistic here is that 55% of malware automatically collected pre-existing data on victims' computers. Um, so malware can do lots of nasty stuff, but in an enterprise, often you know, some of the biggest fears are that you know, your malware is taking data out of your network. Whether it's your information or you know, the information of your employees, like their, you know, their login accounts and whatnot, or uh, your customers' information, uh, again, one of the primary things that people you know, are often, I guess, wary of is the fact that data is moving out. Uh, but there's something that people often ignore. Uh, and that's the fact that all malware leaves behind some information of its own. Um, so this information, finding it, making sense of using it, uh, is what today's presentation is going to be about. Uh, and that's malware analysis. Um, so we've got a couple of goals for today's presentation. Uh, the first one being to demonstrate the value of analyzing malware, uh, whether you're part of an incident response team or just you know, a hobbyist looking for a fun project. And, uh, you know, believe me when I say if you are a hobbyist looking for a project, there's absolutely no shortage of malware um, out there to dig into. If you experience a shortage, uh, feel free to get in touch. We've got some for you. Um, beyond that, we'd like to bring up some cool things to consider as you work on your own malware analysis, you know, whether it's something you've been doing for a while or just getting started. Uh, and lastly, we'd just like to show you some of the, you know, the cool stuff that we've been working on here at Landcope and, you know, more specifically StealthWatch Labs. Um, so I hope to do all of this by walking you guys through the process that we use to reverse engineer CryptoLocker uh, to find some of the weaknesses that we were able to take advantage of uh, in our products. And right after that, we'll then take a look at Operation Tovar, um, the recently announced operation by, led by the U.S. government, and we'll take a look at some of the weaknesses that they were able to take advantage of. Um, so I say, you know, you should be looking at malware. There's lots of cool stuff. Um, so I guess the first obvious question is what information is there to find uh, when you're looking at malware? And I've listed a couple of things here. And at the top, um, deliberately, is command and control hosts. Um, if you're on an incident response team, if you're trying to, you know, work proactively, C2 hosts are some of the best indicators you can find, right? They're really easy to search for and almost, you know, lots of different types of appliances or, you know, different types of visibility providers. Um, so they're great resources, but there's certainly a lot more that you can find in malware. Uh, and the next example that I have, I have here, uh, excuse me, uh, are encryption keys. Um, so you can use these to reveal information that was inaccessible to you before. Um, for example, encrypted command and control traffic or uh, config files that you found along with your malware. Um, and those can often be you know, very, very informative. And beyond that, there are things like implementation flaws and exploits. Uh, so a couple of weeks ago, or maybe it was months ago now, actually, it's been a little bit, um, crypto defense was found out in the wild. And it was a type of malware that was very reminiscent of CryptoLocker, and we've seen a couple of lookalikes, but upon analyzing crypto defense, um, people actually found out that while it was really encrypting your mal, uh, excuse me, files on your computer, uh, it wasn't doing it properly. So they found a way that just about anyone could decrypt files that you know, they had that were encrypted by crypto defense. Uh, and the same goes for exploits. Um, some malware utilizes exploits to either propagate or gain particular permissions uh, and if it's in the code there, you can find it. Um, so the last one that we mentioned here explicitly are malware capabilities. Um, you know, they say you, you don't want to, I guess, judge a book by its cover, and the same thing goes for malware. If you find a type of malware, and, you know, your AV or, you know, your, I guess your Internet searches tell you that this is either, you know, a backdoor or an information stealer, whatever it is, um, that can give you a good idea, but that might not be, you know, everything there is to find. And if you want to find that information, you've got to actually dig in. 
Um, so this, you know, of course, isn't an exhaustive list, um, but what I'm hoping to get across here is that there's good information, you know, hidden in malware, no matter, I guess, what you need to get out of it. Um, so I guess that's the question you have to ask. All of that information and more can be found in malware that you're going to take a look at, um, but I think the first question you need to ask yourself is specifically what it is that you're after. Um, and that's because doing a line-by-line -line disassembly can be, you know, very informative, and a lot of the best write-ups out there uh, are produced by doing just that. And again, I talk about a hobby, and it actually can be pretty enjoyable. Um, but the thing is that an analysis like that can be really, really time intensive. Um, the thing is that in some situations, it's overkill. Um, in some situations, you just can't dedicate the time on one particular sample. You know, if you're at work, maybe you've got to keep moving. Uh, you know, and in some situations, you just need results quicker. For example, in the middle of an incident, you can't wait, you know, weeks and weeks and weeks of analysis time to find those initial indicators. You have to know what you want, uh, go in and get it. So what you need to do, and what we'll be focusing on here a bit today, is to, I guess, identify the type of information that you're after um, to guide your investigation. Uh, so to give you some context moving forward, uh, here's what we do at Lanco. And again, I show you this because it what, it's what dictates uh, what it is that I look for in malware when I'm uh, doing an investigation for work. Um, so we make a set of products to capture, store, process, and analyze NetFlow. Uh, and in short, for you know, anyone who's not familiar with it, NetFlow is metadata that a lot of enterprise uh, routing and switching gear can export right out of the box. Um, it doesn't provide content like full packet capture, uh, but the metadata it provides, for example, uh, source and destination, port, protocol, size, duration, uh, things like that, they're a lot easier and cheaper to store, and it allows us to build audit trails of just about everything that happens, both within the network and uh, crossing over the boundary. Uh, so for me, the most important information in malware are things that we can identify in that type of network data we're collecting, or information about how malware interacts with the network. Um, and this might not be the same for you. And we'll get into that in a little bit when we talk about Operation Tovar. Um, and we'll talk a bit more about their specific goals and the needs that they had. Um, but for now, we're, I guess, approaching this from the point of view from someone at Lanco, from my point of view. Um, so all of that said, we'll uh, get into the malware that we plan to look at today. Um, so hopefully none of you have seen these uh, screenshots on your own computer, you know, maybe on the web or something. But um, for those of you who, ha who haven't, excuse me, um, these are screenshots from CryptoLocker. Um, you know, just during our investigation, we deliberately infected a machine, and these are some screenshots um, that we got out of it. So hopefully this isn't too bad of a spoiler, um, but CryptoLocker is a type of ransomware that encrypts um, certain types of files on a victim's machine. Uh, beyond that, we'll find out more during the presentation, but I just wanted to give you guys a little bit of context. So uh, as a warning, uh, we've got a couple of log-heavy slides coming up. Um, you know, maybe they're not the prettiest, but the goal here wasn't just to tell you what CryptoLocker did, right? Um, what our goal here is, uh, is to show you, I guess, what it looks like to step through this analysis and the process that we went through. Um, so after those log slides, we'll get you know a bit more into Operation Tovar. But you know, hopefully, uh, hopefully you guys get the value out of this that uh, you know we're hoping you do. So getting into malware analysis, um, first we need to make one distinction, um, and that's between two uh, principal types of I guess analysis that you can undertake, um, and that's dynamic analysis and static analysis. Um, so dynamic analysis is, is an investigation that um, involves actually running the malware that it is you're analyzing. Um, this can often yield a lot of information in a quick and dirty fashion, and we'll show you all about that in just a moment. Uh, and then static analysis is everything else. It's an investigation that involves doing um, all, size, all types excuse me, of you know, poking and prodding at the malware you're analyzing uh, without actually running it. And we'll get into that too, following up on the dynamic analysis portion. Um, so let's get started with uh, the dynamic analysis. What we're looking at here are logs from a tool called Procmon. Uh, it's a tool in this internal suite. Uh, it's freely available, but uh, its main utility is to allow us to see what happens on the machine that we're analyzing uh, when we run whatever it is we want to run, uh, in this instance, CryptoLocker. So what we see here is the malware initializing. Uh, of course, we want to capture it from the start because we don't really want to miss any of the valuable information. Uh, so that's what you see. You see um, us starting the process and it creating its threads. And immediately, immediately after that, uh, it begins to just initialize itself in a couple of ways, but uh, the first really interesting thing that we see, um, and you can hopefully make it out in this log here, is that the malware CryptoLocker is loading RSA ENH.DLL. Um, so that might, might not immediately jump out at you, but that DLL is actually the Microsoft Enhanced Cryptographic Provider. Um, so if you were looking at this binary completely out of the blue and had no idea what it was, that might not 
uh, mean all too much to you, but knowing that this is CryptoLocker, um, you know, we have a good idea that this might come in to be important a bit later on. So uh, we'll keep that in the back of our minds. Um, so after the malware initializes itself, we see something that appears to be what a lot of pieces of malware do, um, and that's to begin establishing persistence. Um, so I ran that malware on my desktop, a folder off of it that we were able to see in the log earlier. Um, and here what the malware is doing is it's copying itself into my application data directory. Um, so this is interesting to know, right, to see how it's doing this. But again, this isn't network-centric data, so we can kind of move on a little bit without worrying about this too much. Um, and from there, we see it opens up a second process um, by launching the binary that it just moved. And it immediately becomes pretty clear um, as to why that's happening. So um, if you're familiar with the Windows registry, um, this might stick out to you pretty immediately um, because we see this new process repeatedly creating these two registry keys. Um, it's creating a crypto locker value in both the run and the run once keys. So if you're not as familiar with the registry, um, those two are particularly common in malware because they're, ha they're a way that the malware can make sure it runs when you start your computer. So after this happens, if you were to turn off your computer and then turn it back on and, and log back in, CryptoLocker would start automatically. Uh, so it just keeps doing this without being, throughout the entire execution cycle. Um, so we've seen a bunch of initialization, but at least from our perspective, none of this has been too interesting just yet. Um, so fortunately, we come upon um, these logs in Procmon. So what we see here are TCP send and TCP receive. Um, so this tells us that we're getting some network information, and that's what we want to see. Uh, the problem is that Procmon isn't the best way to view that, um, so we'll switch views over to Wireshark, which is, you know, if you're not familiar, I guess one of the most common uh, traffic analysis tools out there. You know, anyone can download for free. Um, so this is the very same screenshot. I just want to make it a little bit bigger, so I guess we could see it in a bit more detail, because this becomes really important for us. Um, what we see are CryptoLocker sending out tons of DNS queries. Um, you can ignore the .testbed ones. That just happened because of the analysis environment. Um, but this happened actually for a couple of minutes straight. It just kept making, excuse me, um, hundreds and hundreds of seemingly garbage looking requests. Uh, every now and then, like we can see in the middle of this screenshot, uh, we'd encounter what worked out to be a sinkhole. Um, and that's not real C2 traffic. And that's just something other researchers set up to gain statistics on uh, how many people are infected. But we let this continue to run. Uh, and eventually it found a live valid host. Um, so it downloads its C2 payload and continues on. Um, now just from this, we don't know what's in there, right? It was a binary blob that we were able to see, um, but we suspected it might have been important. And if that was what you suspected, you would certainly be correct. Um, because immediately we can look right back at the system logs um, and see this. Now, well, this is not really uh, very stealthy. The, the malware creates a registry key called CryptoLocker. Um, and it stores what it calls a public key. So now this is actually really, really good information for us um, because a public key is something that the malware can be using to encrypt its files. Um, and at this point, we don't know that for sure yet, but this is a really good indicator of how it works. And as the uh, malware's execution goes on, that seems to be the case. So again, this is the same screenshot. I just wanted to make it a little bigger. Um, so we see the malware rummaging through the hard drive of my analysis machine uh, and eventually it finds a type of file, it finds a PDF uh, down there at the bottom of the screenshot. Um, apparently it's interested in PDF files, so what we see is the malware beginning to encrypt that file um, in a temporary file to get rid of the old one and replace it with this new garbage one that we can't read. Um, so as we continue to watch it, we see it crawling down my entire file, excuse me, my entire file system uh, to see this happen over and over again for certain types of files. Uh, and then lastly, we see it come to an end after it searched everything there was to see. Um, it looked for a private key to see if I'd paid yet. Um, I hadn't, so it wasn't there. Uh, and after that point, it logged every single file it encrypted in the registry. Um, you can see that here. It's the bulk of what's on the right side of, I guess, the middle of the screenshot. Uh, and then it started again. So what we just walked through appeared to be the main loop, and it just went over and over and over and over again. Um, so once it's done all of this for the first time, CryptoLocker presents itself to the users in an attempt uh, to make some money. Um, so again, we've gone through at least one complete run here while watching carefully what the malware did. Um, just as a note, we didn't put it in the slideshow because um, I don't think it was really necessary, but we did this a couple of different times um, with a couple of different samples just to see if this behavior was consistent. Um, and it was. So after that, excuse me, after that, um, we have to ask ourselves, what is it that we think we know? 
Um, so here are a couple of the conclusions that we, or the assumptions, excuse me, um, that we were ready to make after that. Uh, the first one being that this malware, CryptoLocker, takes advantage of advanced public key cryptography. And we were willing to make that assumption because A, we saw it load in RSA ENH.dll, which again is the enhanced cryptographic provider. Um, and we saw that public key registry key, which contained what appeared to be a valid public key. Um, so we don't know this for sure yet, but it appears to be a pretty safe assumption. Okay, um, the next thing we saw was that the malware loops through DNS requests for tons of gibberish hosts until it finds an active real one. Um, a note here was that it couldn't have genuinely been random because all of the samples that we looked at created the same domains. So they weren't somehow predictable. And that too is really, really interesting to us. Um, and then finally, the malware doesn't actually be begin encrypting files until it receives that public key from the C2 server. Um, this means that we might have a choke point that um, we are able to take advantage of given that we're looking for data over the network. Um, so there were some other behaviors here that I didn't list. Again, because our goal was to, I guess, only identify network patterns that we could look for. Um, and additionally, there was a little bit of network traffic that we didn't list here. Uh, and that was that CryptoLocker will crawl your network drives. But the thing is that we won't focus on that because that doesn't happen every time, where the things on the screen appear to happen every time. So those are much better indicators for us to look for. Um, so as a note, the heading of this slide is, uh, what do we think we know? Uh, it's not, what do we know? Um, and that's deliberate, right? It's because this type of dynamic analysis is you know, quick and dirty, and it gives us a lot of good information. Uh, for running the malware just a couple of times, we actually have a really good idea of what CryptoLocker does. And the thing is, we don't know exactly why or how, so it's hard to say this will actually happen every time. Um, that said, if your goal is like a quick triage or investigation uh, during an incident, um, this can really give you, I guess, a good value for your time. Um, but we needed a little bit more information. So again, we, um, you know, we're a security product vendor, um, so our goal is to push out a solution, and we needed to have a better idea of what would or would not happen. Um, so what was required of us was to do some static analysis. Um, so we've gone through a quick dynamic analysis, and we've identified a couple of things that appear to be important. And again, that's the potential choke point there, um, that the malware needs to fetch that public key from a predictable C2 server. Um, so if we can find a way to identify what produces that network traffic, we think we should be able to identify any crypto locker infection as it occurs on the network. Um, so to look exactly, or to look a bit further into the how, excuse me, we'll dive in uh, to the binary. Uh, so for this presentation, we'll be using IDA, um, but there are alternatives out there, uh, and I'll mention them a bit later on towards the end of the presentation. Um, so a lot of the time when people hear reverse engineering, uh, what comes to mind is disassembly. And again, that's what we're going to go through here. So as a quick primer, uh, when you write code in a language like C, you write it in a human-readable language. Um, and when you go to run it and build it, it gets compiled. So to make um, what can certainly be a very complicated subject, I guess a bit, um, a bit simpler, compiling your code turns it into a form that the processor you're compiling it uh, for can read. But a consequence of this is that, um, well, for the most part, this is a one-way process. So we can't turn it back into that source code, which would make it a lot more easier to, a lot easier to investigate. Um, so if you were to dive straight into a binary like this, then what you see wouldn't mean very much. Uh, but fortunately, a disassembler like IDA can turn that blob we were looking into, uh, looking at, excuse me, uh, into something that makes a lot more sense like this. So actually, this is just about the exact same code that we were just looking at. Um, but if you're at all familiar with assembly, instantly this becomes um, you know, a lot more legible to you. So this is the type of view that we'll, we'll have as we proceed to investigate CryptoLocker. Um, the problem is that one of the downsides of looking at a disassembled binary is that it can be pretty difficult to just glaze over code and get a good idea of what's up, uh, like you might be able to do with higher level code. Fortunately, uh, thanks to our dynamic analysis earlier, we know what type of functionality it is that we're looking for. Um, and a good way to springboard your analysis is to take advantage of that. Um, and we'll do that by starting in the import section of IDA. And again, this is not something that uh, is exclusive to this tool. Um, the import section shows what, if any, external functions that our malware is going to import. Um, since CryptoLocker, the binary that we're looking at is dynamically linked, um, we can see those in, for the most part, plain English. Um, so highlighted in blue and pointed at by the red arrow here um, is the WinHttp connect function uh, from the WinHttp library. Uh, and this is actually a really, really good find for us. Um, so given that this is part of the Windows API, uh, it's documented very well on Microsoft's website. 
Um, and what you see here is a snippet from that documentation. Um, so the reason that this is a win for us is what uh, I'm pointing at with the red arrow here. Uh, and in short, that says that the second argument passes function uh, is the host name or IP address of the server to communicate with. What we were interested in, what we're looking for, um, is the part of the malware that generates all of those domain names. Um, so if we can, I guess, trace backwards from here where the, uh, where the domain names end up, we should be able to find that. Um, so that's just what we'll do. Uh, we'll start from here. So our disassembler helped us find the location of the call when HTTP connect uh, in the code. And for CryptoLocker, uh, it only occurred once. So what we'll do is we'll step back just a little bit uh, to find a good place to launch our investigation from. And that's what brings us here. So for just a little bit of context on what happened, I guess to, to clarify what happened between slides there, um, the when HTTP connect call was wrapped in a function uh, inside of the call that I've labeled connect, uh, connection check. That's pointed out by the red arrow. Um, so all we did is we stepped up a function or two, and this is where we are. Um, so highlighted in yellow uh, deliberately is the EDI register. Um, and if we follow the code backwards, you can see from some of my comments here, um, that register is how the host name gets passed ultimately um, into, win H into the WinHTTP connect call. So if we step up just a couple of instructions, we see what populates uh, that EDI instruction. What we see is that whatever is in EDX, or excuse me, EAX gets put into EDI. Okay, so we're almost there um, because we see one more call and that's what's pointed at by the blue arrow. Um, so whatever comes out of the blue arrow ends up in EAX. Um, so again, following this, just like, you know, police might, a kind of chain of custody thing, um, the host names that we're looking for are being generated by something um, in this blue arrow. Uh, so we're gonna wanna take a look at that to see you know, exactly how it's making them. Uh, but before we do that, uh, hopefully this screenshot looks familiar uh, because for the most part, it's the uh, exact same thing that we were just looking at, just, I guess with a bit more information at the bottom. Um, by analyzing this, and you can hopefully see it from some of my comments here, um, or in the assembly, if you know, you're an assembly person, after the malware generates and tests a, a domain, we see an increment counter contained in EBX, uh, sleep for a second, and then loop around if it wasn't the domain that it was looking for. Um, so seeing this, it appears that we've isolated the domain generating functionality, um, and again, that was what we're looking for. Um, so we know the domains are coming out of uh, whatever's pointed out by that blue arrow, uh, so let's dive in. Okay, um, so again, this is, just, this is exactly what was being pointed out by the blue arrow there, uh, and we were able to follow it through our disassembly. Um, so what that last loop calls is this here, and I've nicknamed it the DGA wrapper. Um, so immediately at the top, we see um, the first argument passed in, which was the counter, um, compared against 3E8 in hex. Uh, and in base 10, that works out to be 1,000. So this kind of indicates to us that the malware will attempt to generate 1,000 domains if it has to and doesn't find any uh, successfully. And our analysis, our dynamic analysis, um, showed us that this was true. So again, this is another really good indication that we're you know, hot on the trail of what it is that we're looking for. Uh, after that, we see two more function calls. Uh, one pointed out by the red arrow there. Um, the name, I guess, is a little bit of a spoiler. We've renamed it. Uh, but right above that, we see a call, um, get system time. So this is the malware getting uh, the system time in UTC, storing it in a structure, and then passing that into this function that we're calling um, the DGA. Um, so that DGA is the gold mine. It's what we were looking for um, in this piece of malware, and it's what we think that our solution can be based off of. Um, and that's exactly where it was. Um, so through continuing the disassembly from this point, we discovered a control flow um, that you can see here in this flowchart. Um, seated with the date, again, in UTC, um, CryptoLocker generates a key that it passes in just to use as a basic little seed um, to run through a bunch of arithmetic transformations. Those transformations generate the host name and a TLD um, that the malware will you know, slap together uh, and try to connect to. If it can reach it and it's valid C2, the malware will get the public key like we saw in our dynamic analysis, move forward and go on. Um, if it doesn't, it'll keep looping around until it does. Uh, it'll try that a thousand times you know, back to back and if, and if none of those work, it'll sleep for a little bit and then try again in a little while. Um, so we were able to confirm that CryptoLocker will reliably reach out to the domains generated by this, excuse me, uh, the domains generated by this algorithm, and it'll do it as a prerequisite to actually starting its encryption routine. Uh, we were also able to conclude that the same algorithm was apparent in all of the active samples 
um, of CryptoLocker. So as a result of our targeted investigation, uh, we were able to provide coverage that was tailored to the type of technology we provide. Um, and that's the Slick threat feed. Uh, Slick is an intelligence feed that we offer, uh, and we use it as a tool to quickly provide additional coverage for specific threats as they arise. Uh, we were able to use the algorithm here, the DGA, uh, that we extracted to populate Slick with all of the potential CryptoLocker C2 hosts. Um, and this is a great example of how approaching malware with the knowledge of what it is, um, what type of information you can use uh, can really help you, I guess, produce some powerful results quickly. Um, so if this is something you did in your environment and you were working with a different type of tool, say, you know, an endpoint agent, maybe you would have focused in on the registry keys. But again, um, given the type of product that StealthWatch is, that's not the information we were interested in. So we um, determined what we wanted, we went after it, and we were able to make this solution out of it. Um, all of that said, our customers were certainly not the only people faced with CryptoLocker. Um, so the DOJ published this in some of the court documents that were recently published. Uh, and from the top of that block of text there, uh, it says, it is estimated that tens of millions of dollars in ransom payments uh, have been paid by CryptoLocker, CryptoLocker, excuse me, CryptoLocker victims. Although this figure is substantial, it is a small fraction of the actual losses caused by CryptoLocker. Uh, and as an example, lots of people didn't pay the, uh, the ransom, but uh, also in the court documents, uh, the DOJ cited people whose, uh, I guess, expenditures were up in almost the hundreds of thousands of dollars, um, you know, and just in person hours and data recovery fees. So again, this um, is something that affected everyone, not only nationally, but you, know, you might even be able to say globally. Um, so this is where Operation Tovar comes in. Operation Tovar was an operation led by the U.S. government, um, which successfully attempted to disrupt both crypto lock Crypto locker, excuse me, for the amount of times, you know, I've said this and I've <laughs> gone over it, uh, you'd think I'd have that part down. Uh, anyway, um, this went over both crypto locker and the very closely related Zeus game over. Um, so just like what we did here at Lanco, uh, the DOJ and its partners needed to figure out what their goals were uh, and assess the type of uh, capabilities and technical controls they had to address those goals and then figure out what they could do to use those. Um, and again, like I discussed earlier, uh, at Landcope, our goal was to provide our customers with coverage for this particular threat um, using the information StealthWatch provides. Uh, the goals and the tools that the DOJ have are a little different. So here at Landcope, we were able to address the problem at the level of our customer's network um, because they, there they have control and pervasive visibility. Um, the problem is that at the DOJ, they don't actually operate on their customer's network. Um, I guess their customers being all of us here in the U.S., um, you know, we operate our own networks, and the DOJ doesn't quite have uh, direct control over that. So instead of addressing uh, the threat at the same level we did, they had to do the opposite. Um, they had to address the threat at its source. Um, so just like their goals were different, so were their tools. Um, they've, in addition to technical expertise, uh, got the power of law and diplomacy. Um, that said, what they did was certainly not as simple as just, you know, mail off an indictment and watch the malware fade away. Um, but as we reviewed these court documents, we found out that they most certainly did uh, make use of both law and diplomacy. Um, so they used those to exploit flaws that uh, are easy to overlook during malware analysis. Uh, and that flaw was operational security. Um, to quote Wikipedia, OPSEC is the process of protecting little pieces of data that can be grouped together to give us the bigger picture. Um, excuse me, I added the word us, that wasn't part of the quote. Um, but ultimately, that's what led to the naming of the defendant. Uh, so this poster, you know, you may have seen a lot of these, uh, you know, someone talked, loose lips sink ships, right? It's a kind of a common theme going back into a lot of military doctrine, and it's something that you, know, you need to think about um, during your investigations. Um, because here's one, uh, one of the quotes from some of the court documents. Um, it shows that the FBI was able to obtain um, an email address that, the alleged, I guess, um, leader of the, of the malware gang used. And this was by use of a CHS, uh, CHS standing for Confidential Human Source. Um, so effectively, someone, you know, I guess told on them, right? They said, I know this guy's doing this. Here's his email address. Um, the problem is that that alone isn't enough information. Um, you could name me or give my email address. I, I ask that you don't. Um, but this doesn't actually mean that I'm the guilty party. Uh, unfortunately for, for him, the email address combined with the DOJ's ability to obtain warrants uh, meant that they could assemble the necessary evidence, you know, given that it exists. Um, so 
so they were able to turn this IP address here, excuse me, uh, they were able to turn the email address that they were given um, into a list of IP addresses tied to his identity via his ISP. Um, and it all went downhill very, very quick from there. Um, so this quote here says, excuse me, um, in cooperation with Luxembourg law enforcement agencies, pursuant to an MLAT request, uh, MLAT standing for Mutual Law Assistance Treaty, the FBI analyzed the contents of a second-level CryptoLocker server, discovering HTTP access logs that showed which users were accessing the server. Um, of course, you, you know, as we can see in the court documents, his IP addresses uh, were found there. And just to be clear, um, second-level CryptoLocker server means it's not the one that you would have reached out to if you were infected, but it's the, the next level of command and control that those first-level servers reached out to. Um, beyond that, of course, there's more. Um, this one says that, well, I guess I won't read it out um, exactly, but they also found these IP addresses that were linked to him um, on a server they were able to seize with, um, I guess, another law, uh, another MLAT, excuse me. Um, they found his IP address linked to it. And not only did they find his IP address linked to it, but they found out that his account um, had elevated access to it, which, uh, according to the DOJ, showed that he was part of the leader of this gang. Um, and it only gets worse from there for him. In addition, um, on these servers, they actually found a financial ledger of what transfers were made from what victims and what quantity. Um, so finding all of this, you know, I guess diligent accounting work, the FBI actually went to its victims, uh, the victims that were listed there, to validate that these things happened. Um, and they found out that they did. So this was a real, actual ledger from the different, I guess, um, victims of, you know, both um, Game Over Zeus and CryptoLocker. Um, so beyond that, it, it goes even a step further. Um, they actually found a ticketing system to delegate maintenance work, to delegate, excuse me, um, maintenance work on their botnet. Um, so the court documents say that it's not this one person maintaining all of this, it's far too big an effort. Um, so they actually had like an, a whole engineering management system set up, you know, just like you might find in any development shop, you know. Um, but finding all of this information, they were really able to link it back strongly um, to the defendant that they named. Uh, so in my opinion, just one more, you know, um, we've only got an hour, so we certainly can't read every piece of, uh, you know, what appears to be solid evidence, but uh, this year was kind of the coup de grace of all of this investigation. Um, the FBI linked IP addresses belonging to the defendant to account on a hacking forum. The account claimed on multiple occasions to be the author of Zeus. He also claimed the identity, uh, I guess going by the name of Slavic, and Slavic was named the defendant by a 2012 civil suit brought about by Microsoft regarding Zeus. Uh, and that suit resulted in an injunction against him. Um, so ultimately they found him by use of his IP address, his home IP address, saying, hey, this was me. Um, so the moral of the story here, uh, at least this part of the story, is pretty clear. Um, and that's that you know, an OPSEC failure is an important thing to look out for. Um, so I want to take a moment uh, to take what we'll call a tow bar timeout. Um, if you guys are anything like me, you probably think that this kind of stuff is pretty cool. Um, but you might also think that, you know, despite it being pretty cool, uh, this type of thing wouldn't help you um, in your own malware analysis. Maybe you can't issue warrants or subpoenas or injunctions. Um, I'm glad to say that's not true. Uh, not the part um, about you not being able to issue warrants, but the part that this can't be really helpful. Um, because this lack of OPSEC is often observable without needing a warrant or any kind of legal support. Um, so from my personal experience uh, in an incident response team, uh, I can say with certainty that malicious actors uh, frequently reuse identifying indicators. Um, and that's something that you can use to your advantage in a big way. Uh, so this here is just one example. Uh, this is a tool that's freely available, you know, not a paid, not a paid service. It, you don't even need to sign up. Um, this is Virus, to uh, Virus Total's passive DNS tool. So um, I searched for an old CryptoLocker domain, um, and Virus Total, Virus Total told me what IP addresses it had been used to point at. So I clicked on one of those IP addresses, and we can see that up top here, uh, 185.20.227.220. So it returned a list, and there's more than this, but you know, uh, it would have been hard to fit on a slide. It returned the list of all of the domains that pointed at that IP address. Um, so if we were so inclined, we could then click on some of these domains and see what it pointed at, and then so far, you know, um, spread out that fashion. This is a really good way to look for indicator reuse. 
Um, and it can often be used to find domains and IP addresses related to a campaign um, before they even become active. Um, but something to be mindful of is the fact that you can um, apply this type of thinking to lots of different types of data. Uh, for example, emails used to register domains, um, digital certificate names, file names, um, you know, emails used for phishing. You might think that this stuff doesn't get reused, but it gets reused all the time. And if you have a way to look for them, um, it can really help you, I guess, get a much better picture of what's going in, what's going on uh, in the malware you're trying to investigate. Um, and as a note, over the last month or two, we've seen lots of uh, AV firms and you know, security intelligence firms publishing reports. Um, and in these reports, they try to detail the infrastructure of the threats they're investigating. And often, if you read through it, you can see that this is exactly what they're doing. Um, they find one thing that they know is associated, uh, a known bad, they pivot from there, and then they continue to pivot out until they think they've built a, a, you know, a good map of the threat they're investigating. Um, so I wanted to step out of Tovar for a moment to show you how you know, this type of process, while it might seem out of reach, can definitely work for you, you know, in your own investigations. Uh, and I wanted to implore you to kind of get your head out of the binary every now and then um, during an analysis. So before we step back into Operation Tovar, um, I just wanted to, you know, mention a little aside here. Uh, if you're interested in learning uh, about taking advantage of military doctrine, like OPSEC, you know, among other things, in your security efforts, um, Tom Cross, who's the Director of Security Research here at Landcope, uh, is giving a Black Hat presentation along with David Raymond and Greg Conti. Um, this, they titled it uh, Library of Sparta, and it's about taking advantage of a lot of that old military doctrine, and, and current military doctrine, excuse me, um, in your network security efforts. Um, so if you're interested, this talk will be at Black Hat in just a couple of weeks. Uh, it's August 5th, which is the Wednesday at 10.15 a.m. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there for anyone uh, who might be interested. So a lot of what we've spoken about today was um, identifying goals and figuring out how to reach them. Part of um, the DOJ's goals were to be able to name who they think is behind all of this. But additionally, they wanted to disrupt this operation in place. Um, and again, unfortunately, simply you know, mailing an indictment out wasn't going to do it. Um, so this required them to take some additional, you know, further technical action. Um, earlier in what we viewed already, the DOJ uh, displayed their ability to seize foreign servers. Um, and that came into play here, like we can see. Um, but the thing is that we all know, you know, from what we've gone over today, that that um, wasn't going to be enough. Um, from the analysis that we did and we reviewed during the presentation, uh, we saw that CryptoLocker finds its command and control by generating uh, 1,000 domains per day and trying all of them, uh, if it has to. Uh, this makes a server seizure a recoverable failure, because in the event a server is taken away, you can just make one of those new domains with the new IP address. Um, so they needed to do something more. Uh, and in this situation, despite our differing goals and you know, uh, ability to enforce technical controls, uh, both Lancope and the DOJ came to a very, very similar conclusion. The DOJ determined that they needed to attack the DGA. Uh, and just like we did locally, uh, that's what they did you know, on a different scale. Uh, they obtained a restraining order allowing them to make most DGA-generated domains inaccessible. And they did this in kind of an interesting way. Um, so instead of trying to coordinate between every you know, domain registrar out there, which is, you know, I'd wager, just about an infinite amount, the DOJ sent orders to the registries that actually manage the TLDs. Um, so here we see .com, .net, biz, info, and org. Um, so a lot of these domains didn't actually show up as registered or blocked. Um, however, upon registering any, you'd find that you mysteriously couldn't make DNS changes. Um, so that meant that if you wanted to register you being, you know, you or you being, I guess, the criminal behind the malware, if you wanted to register one of these domains to try to I guess get your infrastructure back up and running, you wouldn't be able to. Um, so an interesting note here um, is that co.uk was one of the, the TLDs that CryptoLocker could generate, but we don't see it on the list. Um, additionally, .ru the same. However, if we step back for just a second, um, we see at the end of this screenshot, um, the restraining order says that um, they were able to obtain an order um, directing large domestic United States ISPs uh, to block connection requests to those .ru domains. Uh, they don't see the same for .co.uk, um, which is interesting, and it just leads me to believe that they were able to you know, make that happen without actually requiring any legal order. Um, so I just thought that was something interesting um, and wanted to mention. So these couple of steps together, seizing those back-end servers, 
making both existing um, registered and unregistered domains inaccessible um, were the actions that they decided to take. And in the end, it's very similar to what we did. Um, so shortly op after um, Operation Tovar took place and was publicly announced, um, the National Crime Agency in the UK warned that uh, they expected the disruption to last about uh, two weeks. Um, the good news here is that it's been over a month, maybe, maybe a month and a half, almost two months, um, and all signs point to the fact that the actions taken by the DOJ are still holding. Um, it appears that the bots that belong to the game over botnet are still inaccessible, um, and new crypto locker infections can't receive keys used to begin encryption. Um, unfortunately, the book isn't quite closed, because um, not even a week ago, um, actually, you know, a good amount after we announced the webinar, mm -hmm. Malcovery Security discovered what appears to be Zeus Game Over's uh, extra life, if you will. Um, they showed malware now being distributed uh, the same way via email, just like Zeus and CryptoLocker were. Um, and they found that this malware shared about 90% of Zeus Game Over's code. Um, the only difference is that they're using a new command and control model. Um, on the bright side for us, this new DGA, uh, this new variant, excuse me, is also DGA based, just like CryptoLocker is. Um, so we've been working on our own analysis over the past couple of days, and while this doesn't actually guarantee a relation uh, between the both Zeus Extra Life and Zeus Game Over, um, the DGAs that we've observed in both Game Over and this new variant that, again, we've just been, begun calling Extra Life um, are very, very similar. Um, so we're certainly keeping an eye on what might be the next chapter of the Zeus saga, but we're glad to say um, we've already actually been able to add this DGA to Slick as well. Um, the slick thread feed, just like CryptoLocker and Game Over before it. Um, so in the event that this, you know, does become kind of what people are predicting, um, we've been able to use this malware analysis, just like we described here, um, for yet another threat. Um, so if you're looking to try your hand at some of what we discussed today, um, Extra Life is, you know, a great opportunity. It's got some very similar technology in there um, that you can definitely dig into. Uh, so before we finish up, I just wanted to uh, share a few resources. Um, this is by absolutely no means a complete list of malware analysis tools. Um, there's tons and tons and tons out there. But these are the things that I used um, during the analysis that we showed in this presentation. I said I'd come back uh, to mention them. Um, so the first one that I, that I haven't mentioned yet uh, is your favorite search engine. Um, the internet should be your best friend. Uh, I don't think I've ever come across anything in reverse engineering or maybe, you know, at all that a, uh, an internet search couldn't help with in some fashion. Um, and we're really lucky that uh, the security community, to some extent, is, um, you know, one that is kind of getting the hang of sharing information. So if you're investigating a certain threat uh, and you search for it, odds are, you know, given enough time for, you know, people to actually take a look at it, you'll be able to find some really good resources. Um, so beyond that, here are some of the actual, you know, tangible tools that I guess I used during this investigation. Uh, and the first one was Process Monitor, or ProcMon. You can find that in the Sys internal suite, uh, which is available freely on Microsoft's website. Um, there's tons of great tools in there besides Process Monitor. Um, so if you're looking to build out a new, a new toolkit, uh, I strongly suggest you check it out. Um, I mentioned a bit of Wireshark, and I showed some screenshots. Um, it's, you know, maybe one of the most popular troubleshooting utilities out there. Um, and it's great for, among other things, um, you know, traffic analysis. Um, something I didn't mention explicitly, but I, I definitely used here, was iNet SIM. Um, it's an application that allows you to basically fake the Internet. Um, so if you have an environment set up and you want to let your malware think it's talking to the Internet, uh, you can use a tool like iNet SIM. Um, and I used it via the Remnux distribution. Um, you can think of Remnux like, you know, backtrack or Kali as to penetration testing. Remnux kind of is to malware analysis. Uh, it's not the end-all, be-all, um, but if you're looking to, you know, um, find a lot of tools in one place to get started, Remnux is a great place to look. Um, so lastly, we, we made use of IDAPRO. Um, IDAPRO can be a little cost prohibitive if you're trying to, um, you know, do this as a hobbyist or maybe get this going at work. Um, but some alternatives are Ida Shareware, which is online and legal. Um, it's just a couple versions back. Um, Radare, Hopper, and Objdump. Um, I've used Hopper and Objdump, you know, good products. Um, I've never used Radare, but I've got a, you know, quite a few friends who really like it. Um, so it can definitely be worth a look if you're, you know, trying to get started here. So lastly, um, if you'd like to learn some more, 
a couple of great, great websites. Um, one is opensecuritytraining.info. Um, they've got all sorts of freely available courses on all sorts of topics. So if you'd like to learn assembly or about rootkits or malware analysis, um, they've got pre-recorded classes with labs and you know, slideshows and sometimes videos, uh, great resources. And then here are two books, Practical Malware Analysis and the Ida Pro book. Um, fortunately, there are lots of info on the internet, um, but sometimes it's handy to have you know, one central resource that I guess you can use to answer a lot of your questions. Um, and these are both great books for that. Practical Malware Analysis also has a bunch of labs in it, in it um, and they are you know, very heavily documented and they're all custom written malware for the book. So uh, you know, whether you're looking to get into malware analysis uh, to begin with or if you're already in it but you're looking for something to read, um, I can't suggest it strongly enough. Um, and then lastly, a little bit of a shameless plug here. Um, if you'd like to learn more, we, we try to post some of the cool stuff we do at Lancope's blog um, and to our Twitter accounts, which you can find at um, just at Lancope and at stealth underscore labs. Um, so thanks everyone for, for coming. I think this is